All right, everybody. Well, welcome to um, this week's presentation, Geotechnical Problems Caused by the 2023. And Tuchai, I'm going to need, Tuchai, I'm need your help with the pronunciation of your hometown. <laughs> it's Kahraman Marash. You perfect pronunciation. I'm very impressed. <laughs> uh, the earthquakes um, that we've all been uh, hearing about in the media over the last several weeks. Um, today, today's speakers uh, for this uh, presentation, um, Tucci is an assistant professor with the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, specializing in geotechnical engineering and geomechanics. Her research interests include climate change related geotechnics uh, she received her PhD degree from the uh, University of California, lovely San Diego, in 2017. Uh, Dr. Bowser is originally from Adana, which is one of the 11 cities impacted by the recent series of earthquakes, uh, which struck uh, southern Turkey. We also have Dr. Ozgan uh, Nmanagulu, oh, who's a project engineer at Schnabel Engineering Seattle, Washington office. It specializes in dynamic characterization, constitutive modeling of soils, and numerical modeling and analysis of seismic ground response and soil structure interaction. He holds his uh, master's and PhD degrees in civil and environmental uh, engineering from the University of uh, Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, originally from Adana, which, as mentioned earlier, is one of the 11 cities impacted by the earthquakes. Um, Dr. Okan, Ilan uh, took his bachelor's uh, and master's degrees in civil and environmental engineering uh, from Dohus uh, University and the earthquake engineering department of Handili Observatory and Earthquake Research uh, and Earthquake Research Institute of um, Bogazi University in 2010 and 2015, respectively. He graduated with a PhD in civil engineering uh, from the department of you, uh, well, from the University of Illinois uh, in December of 2020. He's an assistant professor in the Civil Engineering uh, Department of Ankara, uh, Idram Bizet University. Uh, so with me no longer butchering uh, pronunciations here, why don't we just uh, get on with the presentation? Thank you all. All right. Um, hello, everyone. I would like to first of all, thank you all for joining the seminar and Keely, especially for organizing the seminar. Uh, it's a Friday, happy hour time. And yet um, 91 or like plus <laughs> minus us are on the screen and you're willing to hear from us. So we have a lot to cover in very little time. So I'll go ahead and start. So this presentation focuses on the major geotechnical engineering findings from a reconnaissance mission that was performed by Dr. Özgün Numanoğlu, uh, Serhat Erinmez, and I, specifically on major ground deformations caused by the Karaman Marash earthquake sequence. I would like to first acknowledge our collaborators who made this mission successful. Uh, first of all, big thanks to Professor Yusuf Hashash uh, for providing mentorship and guidance uh, throughout the mission. And Professor Onu Pekjan from Middle East Tech University, who is also founder of I4Works and Fidei that we are going to mention later today. Uh, and Professor Okan Ilhan, who is one of the co-presenters, um, I thought that it would be really nice to, uh, you know, he's, he graciously agreed to co-present with us. Uh, he's also a EFI alumni. And I, I thought it would be very meaningful uh, if three of us are here. And I'm sure he's very excited to share what he has to say. And finally, Professor Gune Olgun from Missouri University of Science and Technology. Uh, he's also originally from Iskenderun, uh, one of those like cities impacted by the earthquake. And he provided very useful information about the area during the mission. So what you're going to see in this presentation Details of the coverage of the recon team achieved, a brief intro to tectonics of the area and some ground motion parameters and the side effects will be covered by uh, Dr. Ilhan and comparison of ground motions with the design codes also will be covered by Dr. Ilhan. And uh, Dr. Numanol and I will be covering geotechnical observations, including performance of dams, large scale liquefaction, large scale earthquake in the landslides. And I'm going to introduce you a very interesting case uh, history. <laughs> That is going to be a case history, in my opinion, and uh, we will talk a little bit about cascading events uh, um, where climate change acted as a stressor. So what is not included this presentation, but available for you 
uh, detailed tectonic settings on historical events of the area. Impacts of the earthquakes in Syria, unfortunately, we didn't have a chance to, to uh, perform a reconnaissance in Syria. Um, further details of to the content presented here and can be found at this reference at the bottom. Um, we, we will be more than happy to share the presentation with you uh, and then the references with you. Uh, you can go ahead if you if if, um, if, if you feel like you, you have to read more, um, uh, you're, more than, you're more than welcome to. So um, three major earthquakes uh, within nine hours occurred in the southeast of Turkey, including Syria. Um, so the details of this earthquake will be covered by Dr. Ilhan, so I'm going to skip this. But immediate aftermath, aftermath of the quakes, uh, 11 cities, initially it was 10, and there was it was discovered a couple of days later that there was another city that was impacted, and 13, more than 13 million people were impacted by the events. Uh, casualties are around, it's, it's, it's really upsetting when I say casualties, but more than 50,000 people were killed. Uh, with additional 100,000 people or more probably injured. The Turkish Enterprise and Business Confederation estimated 80 billion in construction and not even including the impacts of the local businesses. So this is a, so we flew to Adana, which uh, where Özgün and I are originally from, by the way, and this was our base during the mission. So we scouted Adana, Osmaniye, Gaziantep, Kahramanmaraş, Hatay, and their districts as well. And we collected perishable data uh, for the for the uh, four or five days in the field. We used uh, three different size drones that were provided by I4 Works. Uh, so this was established by Professor Onur Pekcan, who was also a UFI alumni, by the way. Uh, very proud. Uh, they were very useful in collecting bird's eye views of the large ground deformations that we observed in the field and collecting footages of the, you know, uh, failures or um, interesting features of the, from the remote areas uh, that you will see in this presentation later. Um, data collected from this recon was uploaded to a software called SciTi. Uh, which is a location-based data sharing platform. So you can uh, up download this uh, app and become a member very easily. You just have to sign up. You don't have to pay. Um, and why this is useful? Uh, because um, when you download and become a member, you will have an access to all the um, pictures and drone footages uploaded by the users who are willing to share their data with the public for the better of us. So you can also find uh, some of the pictures, not some of the, most of the pictures and the drone footages if we are gonna show any, so you can find them there. So now I am going to let Dr. Ilhan take over to explain the ground motion characteristics of the event, and then uh, we will come back to me at some point. All right. Uh, can you hear me by the way? Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Bashar, very nice uh, for the very nice introduction. Uh, I'm very glad here to present uh, this material and, and to share the material with you. And uh, as uh, Dr. Bashar mentioned, uh, I will be uh, presenting uh, for the uh, strong ground motion characteristics part. But before that, I would like to start with the tectonic settings. I mean, basically to uh, con uh, basically to illustrate why this has happened. Uh, probably uh, most of you encountered with this information, but as we know, especially the Anatolian block is pushed uh, northward direction by Arabian plate and also African plates, especially for the Arabian plate by the 18 and 25 millimeter per year, but the Eurasian uh, plate is uh, kind of uh, stable. And this is because the Anatolian block is skewed between these two plates. And due to this <clears throat> extrusion, it's, sorry, I'm due to this issue, it's kind of uh, moving west, doing a mess, westward direction. And this is because this leads to a 10 to 20 millimeter per year movement in North Anatolian fault and also nine plus minus one millimeter year sliding and also movement in East Anatolian fault. Of course, we 
focus on the East Anatolian folk on uh, this presentation. But this is the reason that the main reason that we encountered with these series of earthquakes just recently. And basically the area, I mean, if you look at the historical events, basically these are the events uh, that, uh, that they, I mean, that people extracted from the historical documents. And uh, if we look at the area and also historical documents, we realize that there are big events as starting from almost 1,114, 1, uh, the year of 1,114. And the latest earthquake that is between 6.5 and 7 at this region, the magnitude of 6.5 and 7 at this region is around 1971, which means that this area is mostly, I mean, it's kind of quiet up to this point. And this is because we encountered it such a large magnitude earthquake. And as just as introduced by uh, Prof, uh, Professor uh, Bashev, I mean, the earthquake happened on 16th of uh, on six on 16th of February 2020 at uh, around 1 uh, 17 a.m. in uh, Turkish time zone. And basically it has a, I mean, uh, started with around the Narla fault, as you can see, which is a part of the Dead, Dead Sea fault. Then after that, it jumped to the East Anatolian fault zone and doing a bilateral movement, as you can see in the second direction, which is in the Pazarcik and er Erkenek fault, and also in the Amanes fault segment, as you can see in the third direction. And if you look at this photo, we can see around 2.7 meter uh, slip uh, in, due to this earthquake. But after 10 minutes after this uh, earthquake, an aftershock occurred, which has a moment magnitude of 6.6 uh, with respect to the AFAT. But uh, if you look at the USGS, it said that it's 6.7. And after these uh, two earthquakes, two big earthquakes, one of them is uh, the aftershock of the first one, we encountered with the, the, the second one happened, the, the latest one happened, which is the earthquake of 7.5. I'm sorry, this is not 7.8. It should be 7.5 uh, earthquake, which is nine hours uh, later than the first event. And if you look at this photo, we can see around uh, 6.7 meters slip which you can see the, uh, the, 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 the slip between the fences, as you can see. And this is the reason that these, uh, these uh, within almost 10 hours or nine hours, due to these three large magnitude earthquakes, the earth, the, 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 basically the, uh, the effects of the earthquake is almost, uh, was almost spread around 11 uh, <clears throat> cities of the Turkey. And, of course, uh, I mean, this fault mechanism of the first earthquake can be seen easily from the uh, ground motion recordings. Right now, you are looking at one of the ground motion recordings in Kahramanmaraş region, which is the, st which is the station of uh, 4615. And if you look at the displacement time history, you can see, you can clearly see the three slips, which uh, basically delineates these uh, three uh, fault ruptures, the first one and the second one and the third one, which is the second and third represents the bilateral rupture along the East Anatolian fault zone. Um, as I mentioned, these are three big large earthquakes. And if you look at the recordings, I mean, we can see that around Antakya, we, we encountered with a maximum ground acceleration of around 1.23 uh, G and uh, 0.65 G around uh, Kahra at Kahraman Marash. And if you look at the spectral accelerations around one second, we can see up to two Gs and also higher than that. If you look at especially the records at the uh, that, that is exposed to near field effects. Um, I mean, this is because these, these, uh, all of these earthquakes affects the, as I mentioned, the 11 different cities and 
and it was too this is because it was uh, too much uh, hazardous to the region but uh, if you look at the recordings especially by the recordings that right now which are open to the researchers through the uh, strong ground motion database the first earthquake the pazarjik earthquake which is uh, moment magnitude of 8 point uh, sorry uh, 7.9 was recorded around 292 stations as you can see from north around the from the uh, around the uh, from adana to the black sea around 292 stations and for the second event which is the 7.5 pazarchik earthquake was recorded by 268 stations and uh, I mean, of course, I mean, as a civil engineers, I mean, we need to do, I mean, we, we are uh, basically, we are interested in doing, a we, we are interested in doing designs. And this is because, I mean, we look, we need to look at, the, I mean, this is how we can look at the, uh, I mean, do, do, in order to do the design, we need to do, I mean, we need some ground motion parameters and how we can, uh, this is how we can, uh, basically, this is the ground motion parameters that that are provided us by the Turkish building code. This is, I mean, the, the Turkish building code seismic hazard map, and this is the spectra that is relative to the reference condition, and basically to convert it to the different site conditions. I mean, we include the side effects through site factors, but I mean, we need to look at how our measured spectral accelerations uh, compared with the uh, design spectrum, right? This is, I mean, the first thing that we need to do. And of course, the side effects. But what I mean by side effects is that, as we know, once the earthquake, I mean, happens, the uh, the waves, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, propagated through the fault, and then it uh, passes through the crust, which exposed the attenuation effect. But uh, due to the significant uh, difference between the impedance between the crust and soil layers, the excuse me the uh, the ground motions are exposed to the amplification and in some conditions the amplification due to soil nonlinearity and one of the most well known examples is the uh, 1985 mexico mexico city earthquake i mean if you look at the rock uh, recordings and the uh, basically soil recordings you can see the differences i mean the amplification and also in the same case the spectral acceleration okay uh, this is i mean what we call the side effect and similarly if we look at the especially the the first event which is uh, seven, uh, seven, uh, seven uh, seven point eight magnitude earthquake if we first look at the uh, the the stations in Marash, which is the rock station, as you can see, this is the a station which is the VS30 of 731 meter per second, which is basically the rock station. And here you can see the recordings, which is east, uh, west, and north south recordings. And you can look at the building code, Turkish building code design spectra for the uh, return period of 2000. 475 years and also 475 years as you can see the rock uh, station uh, recording is kind of uh, compatible with the, uh, the 475 year design spectra but if you look at the soils uh, the, the the station that is located on the soil we can see a significant amplification right it's almost the recording the spectral uh, the spectral accelerations of the recordings hit to the 2000 for, uh, 2475 years of course this might be due to both side effects and closer distance to the rupture plane similarly if you look at the hatay region i mean uh, firstly again this is the rock site right where the vs30 is around 870 meter per second again the even though the 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 the, the east west and north south recordings for the long period is kind of uh, consistent with the 2475 years design spectrum okay but if you look at the the station on the site we can see a significant amplification i mean it significantly exceeds this design spectra uh that is suggested for 2475 years okay and almost for both short periods and for the long period and if you look at the second event, which is the uh, magnitude of 7.5 uh, 7 earth, uh, earthquake, uh, 
Uh, if you look at the Kayseri region, which is closer to the second earthquake, if you look at the rock site, uh, again, station uh, recordings, which is, I mean, below the uh, bore of the Turkish uh, design spectra, right? As you can see, there is no problem. But if you look at the, uh, the, the, the soil site again, we can see that, especially for the longer periods, uh, both the 2000 uh, 475 years and 475 years spectra are exceeded, especially for the longer periods. Okay, this might be both side effects, and also this station is kind of closer uh, to the rupture plane as compared to the rock sun. Okay, considering all of these information, we know that two large magnitude earthquakes and a series of aftershocks uh, occurred in the region and spectral accelerations from some stations were observed to exceed the design spectra, especially for return period of 2,475 years, which corresponds to the 2% the of probability in uh, 50 years, 2% of exceeding probability in 50 years. We can see that the significant side effect, and right now we are working with the uh, re-evaluation of the current seismic hazard analysis in Turkish earthquake building code and also some kind of development of the region specific site factors and right now thank you for listening to me I would like to stop here and then would like to give up the control uh, thank you Okan so I'm going to give the remote control to um, Özgün if I can find him okay I think I do have it. Let's see. Okay, you should have it now. Yeah. Awesome. I'm trying to. All right, hold on a second. Maybe. There you go. Uh, thanks, Okan. Uh, hi, all. My name is Özgün Numanoğlu. So we will be now continuing to talk about the the aftermath of the earthquake. So now we are kind of stepping more. To the geotechnical observation. So the first question we have is, of course, the, the, the content of the geotechnical part of this presentation. What did we find within geotechnical engineering scope? This on the left side, you're seeing the covered area starting from Adana and covering uh, up to northeast Kahraman Marash and at the south to Antakya, which has also named Antitok. So the Antakya names come from there. So and then it's close to the the Syria uh, at, the, at the borders the Syria and then the Aleppo region. Uh, this figure shows the summary of what we found during our five days reconnaissance. Uh, we have found dam deformations, uh, significant deformations. We have found uh, surface fault ruptures. We have found uh, liquefaction at harbor and coastal line, and we have found uh, landslides and slope failures. So we will go step by step and uh, demonstrate, show you the observation, preliminary observations we have collected from the area. So anytime I show this uh, slide with this yellow circle, that means that we are focusing on that area right now. So we will first start with near Hatay, and then we will uh, show some uh, dam performance observations. And in fact, we started the, the series of observations with a relatively good performance of Yarseli Dam, which is located around the uh, Hatay, Antakya region. Uh, this dam, we used our, we couldn't go to the crest of the dam, so we uh, flew our drones around the crest and upstream and then downstream slopes. And the bottom line of, of, of this dam observation was no significance, no sign of liquefaction or settlement and uh, relatively minor cracks at the crest. And noting that this uh, dam was very close to Antakya, which experienced devastating impacts from the earthquake. However, this dam performed reasonably well compared to the other dams that we have uh, visited. Now, after that, we went to the north, uh, Arıklıkaş Dam near Osmaniye. Uh, and before we arrived there, we knew that there was some, some problems with the dam after the earthquake. So we wanted to be able to observe and measure if possible. You are seeing the bird, uh, bird's eye view of the dam, uh, the reservoir here upstream slope, downstream slope, and then the crest is around eight meters uh, wide. And as you may have already seen from the photo, these dark uh, lines are cracks that have formed after the earthquake. And at the mid center of the 
at the center of the dam, these crack thicknesses are uh, t- width is going more than three meters, and also compared to the crest, the total length of the eight meters. So there is a significant defo- uh, significant cracks and deformations were observed at the crest. More than thirty centimeters uh, wide cracks were observed at the upstream slope near the crest area, and also we have observed some settlements at the top of the upstream slope. Um, the material is most likely pushed on the da- like the down part of the upstream slope because we have seen compression at the near to the crest, a large crack running through the longitudinal direction, and then bulging happening on the left side. And most of the deformations and the cracks we observed occurred either at the crest or at the upstream slope. There was not much visible uh, damages on the downstream slope. Note that at the time of the earthquake and after the reservoir was not uh, working at its full height. So the reservoir levels were relatively low uh, compared to the quote-unquote uh, normal situation. That I do not know what normal situation, but this is what we heard from uh, people working in the state of uh, hydraulics. This is, a, again, a bird's eye view of the entire uh, upstream slope of the dam. You can see that the, the cracks at the crest is running from right wing to the left wing, and then basically the entire uh, crest is cracked with uh, up to four meters uh, wide wide openings. And again, two forms of cracks uh, were observed, one near to the crest, one near to the toe of the, uh, the, toe of the, the slope, and then uh, significant compression was observed around here and then the middle of the, of the up, upstream slope was bulged. So one interesting thing that we observed is at the corner, this is not visible from uh, this plot, but if you zoom into this corner, there are sand boil like sand bursts that we observed that I do not want to call them sand boil or liquefaction yet. And I am sure there are gonna be other reconnaissance teams that are gonna go there and look at these, these the dams in, in more detail, but it is most likely that this, this, this part of the dam that uh, might have undergone a liquefaction and then the manifestation was was a, a sand boil formation at the corner. And this is another uh, bird's eye view of the same dam. Uh, and it also demonstrates the usefulness of the drones during a reconnaissance. And then we went to a Kartalka dam in the Northeast uh, at, near the Kahraman Marash, city of Kahraman Marash, which is, which is one of the, again, the significantly impacted area, especially Pazarjik where Kartalka dam deformation happened. We have seen two different type of earthquake in these failures. One was on the left side, you're seeing an earthquake in this rock fall damage. The rocks were located here. And during the earthquake, they, they basically slid from this area. And then as you can see here, cracked the, the, the left wing of the, of the dam and uh, made the crest inaccessible to the car. So uh, there are some, some people who are trying to access it, but practically, uh, these rock falls cracked the, the asphalt here and then made it inaccessible for the crest. On the right side, uh, what you are seeing is a scale of humans, me and Tuche. And based on the, the this scale and our measurements, we have seen the 30 centimeter wide, 50 centimeter deep cracks were at the crest. And these 50 centimeter deep cracks are passing through the asphalt and reaching to the, to the earth uh, uh, the dam material. And this is another uh, way to look at the dam. You, you may observe here that, and also to be measured at the area, there is a more than 30 centimeter differential settlement. And then differential settlement led to these like the huge cross crests form at the middle of the middle of the crest layer. So based on the, the observations at the different dams, these are kind of obvious statements, but some dams performed very well or reasonably well, whereas some other performed poorly during the quakes. And then we have shown three of them, but there are more than three of them which performed well and which, 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 which deformed significantly. So the obvious question we are asking now is uh, why? Why did some dams perform really well and some dams uh, didn't? And that's why we say further studies required to identify the key aspects that led to poor performance of certain dams and good performance of others. 
Now I'm going to talk about a couple landslides. The, one of the landslides is around Islahi area, whereby again there was a significant uh, damage happened at the region of Islahi, which is connected to Gaziantep. And uh, one landslide, we were driving from Gaziantep to Hatay, and then we have seen on the right side that these operators, these uh, machines were operating to open this road. It was inaccessible and, and, and unsafe to work there. What we have done is we, we pulled over to the, at the place that we can and then deployed our drones and took uh, different photos. This, is, this, this landslide is basically a landslide that led to a, a railroad being buried under, the, under the, the material that slid there after the earthquake. And, 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 and then it basically uh, shut down the operation of the, of the railroad, which was actively operating before the earthquake. And also this uh, photo also shows the usefulness of drones in a reconnaissance, uh, reconnaissance mission whereby if you cannot access the area, you can fly your drones and take uh, photos of it. We have took uh, three uh, like different views of the of the of the area to be able to further you know process the image and being able to uh, develop uh, models later on. We are not yet there, but we do have the data available to achieve that. Okay, this is most likely the most interesting one of the the landslides or slope instabilities that uh, we will talk about. And it took a lot of media attention too, which is right near the Syria border in Altunuzu. Uh, what we have seen there was this huge crack that split the oil uh, oil trees and then the olive farms, not oil, olive farms apart from each other. So this part was connected to this part before the earthquake. And the, there were a lot of speculations whether this was a big fold that was passing through there. But rather than being a foal, it was a split open of, uh, of a re region that was sloping uh, 10 to 30 degrees, depending on where you are. And these cracks are more than 20 meters deep, more than 400 meters long, and more than 200 meters wide. Now, interestingly, and this is also a lesson learned for the reconnaissance, when we were talking to the, the locals in the area, Tuche was asking about, uh, you know, what happened, how was the situation before. One of the locals uh, mentioned that the area received significant rainfall a day before, uh, day before the earthquake, and they, they informed us that that was a not a usual amount of uh, rainfall that would generally come at those uh, periods of times. So now we have the, the heavy rainfall information as well as a huge crack in front of us. And when we were talking to the the kids at the area, uh, they they mentioned saying that there is another crack running in different, like in, in similar direction at the back of their houses, like 500 meters away. So we we jumped into car, went back there, and then we found another back scarp like. So this is the the big. Uh, slope in instability that we have showed, and this is where we saw another another crack happening. By the way, you can go to Google Earth and find these uh, the cracks. It's they are visible now in Google Earth. So there were the two back scar like uh, one the crack here and one back scar like formation here, and there are houses in between these these two two cracks. And what we have seen that the houses moved significantly. And not only the houses, either the houses themselves or the things around them moved significantly. One of the locals said that this pipe was a sewer pipe that was running straight. And the day after the earthquake, he had to build a new pipeline here to accommodate for this lateral uh, differential movement. So now, again, we observe these. We do not necessarily have all the answers, but at least we have some questions. Was this landslide already mobilized before the earthquake? Did heavy rainfall do anything to this, this, this slope before the, before the earthquake hit the area? And we know that after the earthquake, we know what happened there. And the other question is, is this uh, slope gonna mobilize in another earthquake, like aftershock, or is there any you know, slow movement that, that we are not necessarily seeing visibly, uh, visually, or what is going to happen to this area after the earthquake? So these are all questions that, 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 are, that were motivated after the reconnaissance. So intermediate observations, again, was the slope already moving before the earthquake? What is the impact of the heavy rainfall? It happened unusually at the time, right before the earthquake. 
uh, and how can we uh, identify or quantify possible mobilization after the after the main slip and how we can estimate what would happen during the aftershocks new earthquakes or with time and eventually the main question is i showed you how we showed you how that moved the, the the fundamental question for us is how will this landslide impact the locals living in the area because you know the our fundamental goal is uh, you know if we are doing a disaster engineering you know saving human lives before or after the earthquake so how will this landslide impact locals living in the area i think is the key question that we will be seeking answers for uh with that one we are going to talk about grand subsidence in iskenderun a lot of liquefaction stuff that uh, to che i'm going to give the floor to you to continue Great, right, thank you can you give up the remote control first i actually don't know how to do that oh god no oh uh, there you go hold on i did okay yep. awesome. thank you oh, okay so now it's mine okay great um hello again so now i'm going to talk about as i mentioned before in the the, the beginning of this talk we were going to focus on the major ground deformation so we're going to continue with the major ground deformations and one of them is which ground subsidence in Iskenderun, which is a very, a lot of liquefaction, a lot of ground subsidence, a lot of settlements. Uh, I'm going to puzzle you with a couple of questions here, so just be ready for it. Okay. So one of the major ground deformations, as I mentioned, from the field recon was in Iskenderun, as you can see, Iskenderun is sitting uh, in this very nice Mediterranean sea coast and surrounded by Amanos Mountains. So when we first, um, I will talk about this figure later. So when we first went there a uh, couple of days, maybe like a week after the earthquake. So this whole boulevard was uh, covered in water and sand that were liquefied. So these are all reclaimed sand. So um, the legend says, it's not a legend, but it's true. Um, so this whole area of Iskander and starting from here, up to probably here, it's sitting on a reclaimed sand. So this this was all sea before. I believe they started um, um, applying these like fill uh, in the late uh, 1930s, and then they filled this part gradually, and then now this is the final coastal line uh, of uh, Iskenderun. So, um, and then we also observe some. Uh, these, especially um, liquefaction, was accompanied by lateral spreading and subsidence across this coastal strip. So as you can see in this figure, these are the liquefaction manifestations that you can obviously see. The, these were massive mess, and some of them were cleaned, by the way. So what else you see here is a collapsed building, unfortunately, another collapsed building, and another uh, building which was tilted. So I'm going to get to those later. And we also observed near Fairfield widespread liquefaction. Um, so this is this is a really nice textbook uh, sand boil that you can see. Uh, so this was observed in a um, fill rec reclaimed fill uh, area as well, but there were not significant loads that were applying, uh, you know, on this uh, soil layer. So um, so this that's why we call it near Fairfield uh, uh, liquefaction. So here another interesting uh, like a faction example from Nihal Atakash Mosque, and which experienced sand ejecta at the corner of the structure. But this mosque, uh, I believe it was uh, built in 2017 or 19, if I'm not wrong, uh, performed very well uh, despite these, um, you know, uh, like a faction and also um, really large uh, settlements, like 25 centimeter of surface settlements all around the mosque was observed. So there is a reason why it did not have a lot of images, uh, but just the, there was a just uh, 25 centimeter of differential settlement. I will get to that later. Um, but apart from that, so this is mosque and right next to it, this is the coastal line here. This is where the sea starts. You see there are, um, between 10 to um, between 10 and 25 cent centimeter wide uh, cracks observed. So these were the manifestations of the lateral spreading. 
we already covered that. And this is also another manifestation from lateral spreading from the same area. So this is the mask you're looking at here. And right across this mask, there's a really big shopping mall. The shopping mall uh, right in front of it actually is at the entrance in the middle of the shopping mall. Uh, we observed some ground subsidence, like maybe two, three inches. It's an interesting story, it needs to be investigated further. Uh, there was a diaphragm wall during the construction, uh, during the construction of this uh, shopping mall, and the diaphragm wall failed. So then repaired it, they, you know, they redid everything again. So um, we believe that by just like talking to uh, local engineers, we believe that this ground subsidence is observed in the same location that the diaphragm fall, uh, diaphragm fall was. So we were, uh, we tried to get, we tried to go to the basement to observe if there's any signs of, um, you know, um, with the, you know, for the lateral movement from the diaphragm wall, but we were not let. So that's why we had to just give up. And then uh, because they said, okay, ministry, some people, some folks from the ministry came and then they investigated and this building is completely fine. They just didn't, you know, uh, after the earthquake, they, um, folks didn't want any um, speculations or like the, that was, you know, going around and telling people that this building is not safe. So another interesting um, settlement uh, issue, one meter, more than one meter. So this is a part of the uh, fisherman dock or fisherman wharf. Um, so we were told that these rip out material rock blocks were visible and they were all above the water before the earthquake, but now, and this, um, and then also you're looking at this really big truck, which was a sink. Uh, which was sunk in the water in the on the panel, uh, concrete panels. So we observed more than 50 centimeter uh, ground subsidence in this location as well. So here we also saw lateral spreading, uh, you know, openings of the concrete panels, destruction in the concrete panels. Here is the truck that is uh, uh, sunk in the uh, water in the concrete panels. So to summarize the settlements, so this is the, you know, the tip of the dock. So from here, so it's, so it's a the, the settlement is here is about 1.5 meter, which we were told. And if you just go inland, if you just follow this arrow, the settlements actually decrease, but still very significant settlements along the coastal line. So this is an interesting picture that we took with drone. Um, so um, please be prepared. I'm a teacher, so I will have an assignment at the end of this presentation for you. So we are gonna come back to this later. So here we have this hotel, Ramada, which is heavily damaged. Uh, sheer walls were, you know, failed. And um, here you're looking at a total collapse of a building. And here you're looking at this tilted building, this one, it actually tilted really interestingly. We couldn't figure it out for a while. And this building, Yildiz Plaza was also tilted. And this building, very nicely standing, similar story, uh, similar everything, uh, but some buildings performed well, some didn't. So we're gonna um, try to understand how, how and why. And what we did very preliminary because we collected a bunch of information. We did, uh, we measured the settlements along this coastal strip. Uh, the first part is the Atatürk below art. And then the second row is uh, Beshtan Musbulo art. And we also did, took some calculations, uh, measurements, sorry, um, uh, perpendicular to these below arts. And then we just used this um, ground failure index based on the settlements and the tilt. And we plotted these uh, according to the building, building number versus ground failure index. As you can see, most of the buildings along this coastal strip uh, and on the Atatürk below art is uh, experienced significant ground failure. So now we are collecting more information about the foundation types of these buildings. We know a couple of them, but we are collecting, um, you know, information about the foundation or in every individual building. And also we, are, we, we now have access to a couple of geotechnical site investigation reports um, before the construction and um, everything is coming along very well. But um, so, so far, just to show you preliminarily, um, so most of the buildings in this below art, um, unfortunately um, experienced significant ground failure. 
So the conclusion, widespread liquefaction, obviously. And we, we both saw near field field and saw stretch interaction type cases. And the settlements were significant and lateral spreadings were also significant. So I'm gonna come back to that later, but before that, I would like to introduce you a puzzling case uh, history because, so Özgün and I are both from Adana. When we heard that the 13 buildings collapsed, we just lost our minds, right? Uh, because all these um, collapsed buildings are in our neighborhood, by the way. So uh, here are some pictures uh, from the collapsed buildings that my sister took uh, after they escaped from the uh, after they escaped from the building. So this is an, another building. I'm gonna um, play it. So this is the tilted building after the first earthquake. So this building is actually is this um, exactly looking looking like our building, the same type, because it was built by the same contractor. And the contractor um, escaped to somewhere else to, to uh, you know, he went abroad um, during the, uh, right after the earthquake, unfortunately. So, and we couldn't reach to him for a while because we were curious about the, um, you know, foundation type, geotechnical site investigation reports. I was just like, you know, bugging them constantly. Um, but building was just still, but it's, it's heavily damaged. So one interesting thing here though, as you can see, I mean, you saw probably if you remember, Adana is about 200 kilometer away from the epicenter. And Dr. Ilhan here processed the ground motion reports downloaded from a station approximately 1.3 kilometer away from one of those collapsed buildings. So these are all collapsed buildings in Guzalil neighborhood, in our neighborhood. And you can see that ground motions are very weak. They're about 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.05 G. So these motion would only shake a glass, right? But we are talking about 13 collapsed buildings. So Dr. Nomanolo, Dr. Olgun and I were invited to a workshop organized by the mayor of Adana. And we spent a full day discussing why this happened and what we can do to, you know, uh, to build a like a more earthquake resilient uh, Adana for the future because Adana is also in the region, a seismically active region. So you can argue the quality of the concrete, right, uh, that was used in the construction forever. But we believe that this is a very interesting event that needs further investigation. Right now, we are on the we are on the process of um, performing a microzonation study to understand why this happened. Because this cannot just be because of a soft story problem, or um, because there are a couple of the buildings collapsed. They do have a soft story problem. They collapse like a pancake, like you saw in the pictures. But some of them just don't make sense. So. Um, and, you know, 1,000 people died. 1,000 people were killed. It's just significant. Um, so another point that I would like to um, focus here is the um, cascading hazards, which are induced by the climate change. So I'm going to, uh, I'm not sure if you've seen this video before, but I'm going to uh, play it. All right, so uh, these, this, was, this was a flooding happened on March 15 and killing more than 15 people in Obiyaman and Shanlurfa. The root cause of this flooding is actually the seismic, I mean, of course there are heavy rainfall, but actually the seismically induced landslides during the earthquake sequence. So as you can see from this picture, this was taken from NASA uh, Goddard Space Flight Center and they identified many, 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 many landslides everywhere. So these landslides blocked some of the stream beds and generated debris and mud flow that were triggered by the rainfall. 
So as a result, many cities reported flooding, especially in the tent cities, causing disruption in food delivery and such. So I was just in Iskender last week, actually. So there was a flash flooding occurred uh, along the coastal, coastal strip like multiple times. And since the earthquakes, um, that coastal strip that I showed you have been uh, continuously uh, flooded with the seawater. And this would may negatively impact the post earthquake behavior of for foundation building performance as well. So um, the general conclusions, um, major ground deformations, landslides, uh, fault rupt. We haven't show, we didn't show you any fault ruptures, but there we documented some. Um, liquefaction, landslides, fault ruptures, and um, so we believe that alternative landslide or slope instability problem is sh should be monitored because in our opinion, our ex you know from by just you know talking to locals and you know doing a little bit back office study, we believe that it's still moving. And what would happen if heavy rainfalls continue, and then would the whole you know landslide will be mobilized or not? So um, other than the cases. Um, very interesting, and it is attributed to the lack of technical expertise on the earthquake resistant design for construction practices. And this, there's a probably unforeseen seismic amplification in this area. And I know the stratigraphy area. So it's a very interesting um, geology, uh, I would say. So there are some unknowns remain that needs further investigation. Um, one of them is actually the settlements in Iskander. Are they caused by reconsolidation or the lateral moments? Because we observe lateral spreading, right? And then those settlements, like up to 1.5, they're very significant settlements. And so there are also overlooked cascading events, climate change acting as a stressor on the earthquakes, uh, earthquake induced failures, and we have to uh, do something about those landslides. I don't know what, uh, why, but if you do have any idea, please do let us know, because we can only see them from the satellite images. And Adana, side amplification problem, probably, uh, was it caused by stratigraphy? Um, because I, I, as I mentioned to you that I know the stratigraphy very well there because I studied there. Um, so these are the things that um, <laughs> remains unknown. <clears throat> So then it's your assignment. You don't have to come up with the answer now. So I'm going to pose the question and then we included our email addresses. So please, um, if you have any ideas, opinions, you can definitely send an email and we will be happy, more than happy to discuss. So we came back to this picture again. So this is nice hotel, still building, but heavily damaged, collapsed and standing with very slight damages. They're all sitting on the same soil. Uh, there is like a 0.9 meter of fill. And then we have up to three meters clay, gravelly, silty sand. And we have clay sand until 30 meter. And the groundwater is at two to, uh, two to three meter, uh, somewhere around here. And there are uh, signed investigation reports that we collected. So this is from one of the boreholes. So these are the SPT numbers. So it starts very high, you know, at the fill, and then you see it goes down to valleys like 14, 15, 17. Um, also, another information for you is the soil type. It's SM, uh, according to USCS. And the, um, um, the density is about 1.8. So these are not that important at this point. but so my question to you, so although they're all sitting on the same soil, and I'm going to give you another hint, they do have the same type of foundation. Why do you think, and I will also tell you that these are not because of structural damages. So there are no structural damage involved. Why do you think number one, still standing, number two, only got um, like oh, heavily damaged and three number three collapsed. So these are all uh, that we would like to share with you today. Thank you so much for your attention. And uh, we included our email addresses here. If you have any questions or if you have any idea about the case history, please do let us know and we are happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you.
Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. And I don't know who's gonna take over, but Kurt, are you there? I'm still here, yes. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Perfect. I was worried for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, no, I, I guess as um does anybody have any questions uh for the for the presenter? My name is I have I have a couple of questions, very short questions. Uh I am from Seattle, Washington, working for Sound Transit, and I'm also UOI alumni. Uh, UOI alumni. Uh, the first question is that what is the, what was how shallow the epicenter of the both earthquakes? Were they unusually shallow, uh, or they were just uh, give me an idea about that? The second thing is that I hear a lot about you know hundred thousand buildings collapse or near collapse, but I don't hear much bridge collapse, do you think that has to do with the bridge design code in Turkey or something else that I don't know? Thanks. Um, I can start with the, the, the um, Okan, are you there? So you can- Yes, uh, by the way, the, all of the, 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 the three earthquakes that I showed, I mean, the one earthquake, the first earthquake, the aftershocks and the, uh, the second uh, 7.5 earthquake were very shallow basically. They are they they are less than the focal depth of uh, fifty kilometers, which are very shallow earthquakes. I think uh, probably this answer your first question. So my understanding is there was not much energy attenuated, basically based on since it was very shallow. Uh, yes. Pretty much okay. Thanks. And the Definitely. second question is a design question you may or may not have uh, code related as well. I, you know, luckily that we don't have much uh, bridge collapses there, and anyone had any, any idea why? Well, there weren't too many. I think I we only saw two, and then we also collaborated with structural engineering group uh, who were doing reconnaissance at the same time. So we did write a report together, but uh, there are some couple of like puzzling questions uh, that they are trying to answer, but our focus was not really um, bridges, but I believe there were two, but other than that, they performed very well. I would definitely uh, comment on the, because those are large, big projects, right? And they do have, um, you know, um, because in, in, from our perspective, those the heavily damaged buildings, they are either because of the, you know, um, uh, lack of design, um, you know, understanding, and, and then also not very good practice, unfortunately. So um, those are the two points, but with those large uh, projects, there are always, you know, um, point checkpoints that, you know, the design has to be checked all the time, or maybe we are over-designing. I don't know, maybe my colleagues can answer this better. I'm not a bridge engineer, uh, but um, anyone want to chip in, Okan or? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, Utkan, by the way, I, I... Hope I am uh, pronouncing your name correctly. Oh, uh, perfect. You, you have no problem there. Okay. I, I, I also locate in, uh, in Seattle uh, and I work in Chernobyl Engineering, Seattle office. So bridges, tunnels, and retaining walls were relatively performing. Like, like uh, what, what, what overall understanding and consensus was that the bridges, retaining walls, and tunnels uh, performed relatively good. Not many, many, many failures. But uh, more than that, I think after this maybe presentation discussion, we can send you the report that was specifically written for bridges that performed during the earthquake. So you can have a broader uh, information about okay. different bridges. If you can maybe, uh, you can send the e your email address, I think specifically to like people too. If you can send us your email address, we we'll can do that. direct you to the, the, the specific bridge report. That was yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So, and um, I saw a question uh, on the chat box. Uh, so, if climate change causes earthquakes now, so let me correct that one. I did not make a statement uh, that climate change causes earthquakes, but uh, earthquakes causes landslides and with the heavy rainfall and you know uh, unexpected uh, heavy precipitation. 
they do carry those, um, you know, landslide material debris, and then they cause flooding. So these are called cascading events, for example. So when those landslides happen, I showed you a picture where they happen from the NASA satellite images. They're in the remote areas, right? And it doesn't hurt any people. So they just happen. But when there's a rainfall, and those like, then they block those uh, stream beds, and then they start flowing downstream, and then whatever it's meeting at the downstream, it just washes everything away. Okay, so um, yeah, Ellen is asking, I may have missed this, but are there all the buildings class supported? No, so they all have MET foundations. Um, we would be more than happy to share the, our slides. There is another question someone is asking. Uh, Rafael is asking, are there any tools at present date to pre predict when earthquakes could happen, e.g. geotech instrumentation? So should you want to answer this question? <laughs> no, I want you to answer this. <laughs> Not, uh, with all the, you know, experts, present in this uh, session, I'll say, not that I know of that can predict when the earthquake can happen. We can estimate the damage and uh, take precautions against it, but I do not know any technology or any uh, method that gives you a meaningful heads up uh, <laughs> before the earthquake hits. hits. Speculative arm waving, and I know someone is laughing right now, uh, Five seconds before, I have heard stories, but not meaningful timeline so that you can, you know, act upon it. And Okan, Tuche, <laughs> you can, you can, you can agree or disagree on this one. Well, yeah. Now, so actually, my nephew has an app now, you know. <laughs> so it 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 alarms. There's like an alarm ringing when there's like an earthquake from afar. And, um, you know, so he just like calls us and says, oh, there's an earthquake because there's when it happens in the far away. So, you know, when it first happens, it creates like an alarm. I think through like it sends signals through Wi-Fi uh, signals, I believe. And then his phone, you know, but it's just for like uh, before 20 seconds tops, I believe. No, I think probably, probably it's just, I mean, the, probably the early warning detection, just uh, detect the P waves, maybe three or maybe two or three seconds before, I mean, just uh, accurately. We have some more questions. Yep. I'll just rehearse it and maybe... Uh, was there a significant damage to railroads other than the track that was buried? Yeah, there were, but so we did not document those, but they do exist in other reports. So there was like a very iconic uh, picture that they took where the railroad was like shifted because of the fault rupture. The interest, just to expand on that interesting thing was the Turkish, uh, engineers were very fast on fixing the the railroads because they were there the day after and immediately got fixed and opened again as you have seen in the in also the the photo that we have we have shown the, the, the both the construction people and the engineers were very rapid on, on on fixing those so even though the extent might have been more we might not be able to document that because of the the fast action of the the turkish so um department. Yeah, but Hatay Airport was damaged um, because there was like a compression. So the, the whole runway was, you know, uh, fractured. And this and it happened during the first earthquake and it uh, hindered, you know, um, rescue operations, which was very detrimental, uh, especially for the rescue operations. And they only fixed it after like six days. Another question, by the way, this is coming uh, multiple times. So. Uh, early warning system. Is there any early earthquake warning system in Turkey, uh, Turkey, or would it have saved lives if there yes. was? Yes. Uh, 
Yes, especially there is an early warning system in Turkey, in Istanbul. I contributed that because I mean, I, I know that, but not for saving the lives, especially right now, the early warning system is working for, especially for the facilities. Let me give an example. For example, in Istanbul right now, the gas distribution, Istanbul gas, gas, gas distribution system has an early warning system. For example, if the early warning system detects the P waves, uh, after you know the, the the time between the P wave and the S wave, it shuts down all the critical gas pipelines in order to prevent any you know in the case of breakage in order to prevent the leakage. Right now, yes, there is early warning system in Istanbul, but I don't know for the other regions. So another okay. que another question is uh, for the reservoirs. They all seem to have a low pool elevations. Was there any indications of, I do not know this word. Any, yeah, I do not know what the, that word is, but, and how do you think the embankment would have, uh, probably indications of seepage maybe. Uh, and how do you think the embankment would have responded if the reservoir was full? So, Tuche, maybe I give it first shot and then we can, <laughs> So our understanding is, and this is based on all about the, the verbal communication with the people who, who worked on those dams, the reservoirs were in fact at low levels. And one of the reasons that they were low levels were because they were having a dry season. And that's why the, the elevations of the top of the water was, was not in quote unquote normal conditions. And to just speculate, and I, I, I do not know what would happen, have happened, but the cracks that formed in one of the, the dams were above the water level. So if the water was there and those cracks were the coinciding, then we would likely to have a seepage problem. But because the water was low, uh, we did not see any 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 you know spilling, overtopping, or or or, or you know water going from one side and bursting from the other side. We did not see any of those, any of those uh, evidences. And Tuche, if you remember any more from the people who we talked to, please add. No, I think you addressed the question very well because yeah, I would definitely, um, you know, I remember they were telling that it was a dry season and because it was not raining much, you know, it was unusual for the season as well, by the way. So that's why those like levels were very low. There are many other questions, by the way. I do not know how <laughs> we want okay. to do this, but you know. So, yeah, we can go forever. But okay, yeah. so let me see. Taller buildings had deeper foundation excavation. So more of the poor soil was removed from and the structures had you no, know, most soil was removed. <laughs> um, so let's see. Wow, okay. Dylan. Okay, I'm not gonna give it away because it's going to be a midterm for the deep foundations, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so I'm gonna stop here talking about, if you do have any ideas, please send me an email. <laughs> I, I, I would be happy to uh, discuss. So Okan, maybe this question is for you. Comparing the design spectra of the Turkish Typhlic Code and the compute and response spectra from the recorded exam, will Turkey need to update their building codes? Definitely update building code, especially the site factors, because if you open the site factors in Turkish building code, it is directly copied from the IBC, which is international build. The, I mean, IBC 2015, which I is, think the, oh, yes, yeah. sorry, oh, sorry, or can I, I, I no, 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 uh, it is, we, which is originally from the Sehan and Stewart 2014. And probably we need to, we should, I mean, we must depend upon our region specific side factors and i mean currently we are working on this basically together i will i think i'll broaden that question and and, and pose another one like uh, from the recorder so will we need to update all of our building cones or are we gonna change the the way we are doing the things are we gonna be continue working with you know uh, a deterministic or, or specific design spectrum or 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 you know the specific return period, or maybe or use site questions, or are we going to go more towards site specific uh, analyses? Whereby we, uh, as a young engineer, I'll, I'll propose this: use uh, site specific 
uh, response analyses and more you know detailed analyses toolbox that we have available to all of our all of our engineers i think that question is great but i think it is not only for turkey it's for 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 the for for everywhere plus the method itself are we going to keep using the same methods or are we going to you know put one more step and use available but not widely used tools that helps us to do site specific analyses all right so i will i will also would like to take this last question uh and i'm going to pose it to okan and you, you're gonna know why um just a second are there enough engineers in turkey available to perform safety assessment of the buildings that survived but are damaged uh i think so yes uh i mean um for example i also i mean personally served for the damage detection in Hatay for almost four days. I mean, um, uh, I mean that I think there are sufficient uh, engineers to, especially for the safety assessment and also damage detections. Uh, but uh, I mean, there were, I mean, so many damaged buildings. I mean, uh, if I remember, if I recall correctly, for three weeks or I mean, almost four weeks. I mean. The damage detection, I mean, was I mean was was ongoing. I mean, because the, there there were so many buildings that, that was affected by the earthquake. But I mean, as an answer to your question, yes, we have. Okay, Okan, you you did that. You were assigned to Hatay, right, Antakya? Yes, Hatay, Hatay, uh, uh, close to a village that is close to Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the last question we can all answer this. And I think this should be answered because it's very unfortunate that such things are happening. The question is, what are your thoughts on the relationship between planetary geometry and earthquakes? Uh, probably many of us saw the person estimated these earthquake sequences prior, prior to three days of devastating events. By knowing, that, by knowing there is no currently any scientific background on that, just wanted to hear your thoughts. Thank you for the presentation. And yeah. I mean, this is, it is very unfortunate that like such people are making such statements. And, you know, my genuine answer to that, you know, if you do a 10,000 estimation in, 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 in a week and two of them are statistically, you know, hitting the, the, the broader, broader region, people pick on that and it's easy to delete all the other tweets and then keep them the focus. It's very unfortunate. And I do not think we need to spend more time than this, but no, that's 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 not true. That's that we do not have capabilities to estimate earthquakes three days prior to prior to it happening. And I think I'm gonna stop here to not to you know elevate myself to wrong levels. <laughs> well, yeah, Özgün and I sat on the same table with that person at the workshop. So yeah, so um it was it was unfortunate, really, and um, I have nothing else to say, really. Is that a wrap? <laughs> I guess we might have I might have missed uh, some yeah. questions if I did. I was, yeah. Okay. Um. So. So there is on, one more at the bottom. Hard to tell from the picture, but could the buildings that failed have been due to the orientation of the buildings? Could it be, but there is another reason that I know. <laughs> and I'm not going to reveal the answer. <laughs> and I said the settlement was greater towards the coast, so perhaps the differential in settlement was greater over the buildings that failed. Not, not quite right. So because along that coast, I measured like 27 inch settlement and um, and I that hotel. Oh, by the way, um, I saw one question before. They're all about the same height, by the way. There are not like too many differences in the, uh, the stories. All right. I think that's a wrap. Thank you guys so much for your presentation. Of course. We Thank enjoyed you very much for joining. Thank yeah. you. All right. Thank you for the invite. Thank you.
Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.